Hey everyone, welcome to episode 93 of the Serres podcast. I'm your host Stelios and the founder and director of the World of Serres. This, this following conversation is with a good friend, Lauren Hiller, Senior Commercial Officer of the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC. If you've been a long-time listener, you know that Lauren was also on episode 7 of the Serres podcast, which was roughly, what, 18, 20 months ago? With everything happening at the moment, you know, with Seaspiracy going on and, you know, lots of fish-related episodes, we thought it'd be great to get Lauren back on the podcast. Although we don't go on about it too much, it was just nice to have a recap of everything. As ever, I love the fact that Lauren always comes prepared. She's a confident speaker in my view and always gives me a little challenge too. Lauren has asked that if anybody wants to get in touch with her about anything MSC related, whether you're a member or not, just email her on MSC in the UK at MSC.org. I repeat, MSC in the UK at MSC.org. But I'll also pop that email in the show notes. So just go looking for it there. As we'll know, we've had lots of fishy conversations over the last few weeks and we've had a few real like high up people that know about fishing and the seas they just reach out to us but aside from that we've also had lots of feedback so if any of you want to send us any feedback or if you think we've got something wrong or we've got something right just get in touch at info at worldofseras.com we appreciate all the feedback it's great with all these fish related podcasts i've been trying to formulate a question a hypothesis in my head um i, I and I say it live in the podcast. I've said it a couple of times, but I don't know if I've got it right. But now I've got a bit of time. I want to pose this hypothesis or question. Take your pick. Any special, If anybody out there understands about fishing, economics, or anything sea-related, what would genuinely happen to the sea and the planet if nothing was ever fished again? This is only a hypothetical question, but it's just what would actually happen? What would be the butterfly effects? What would happen to the economies? What would happen to the, the seas? I don't live in the world where we think that's OK and it's going to happen. But it's just a weird hypothetical situation that I'd love to sort of get an answer to. As you may have heard recently, we have started slotting in these adverts at the beginning of each podcast. We will never insert ads into the middle to break the conversation. So we hope that's cool with you. Everyone in the food business is busy. We know that. You also balance the need for making more profit by selling unique food to customers. In our view, you should make profit when closed and sales when open. Let's think of butchers for a moment. They don't only sell fillet steak and, and ribeye and so on, do they? They have multiple cuts and then all the trimmings go into products like sausages. Think of how they turned a low value ingredient into £8 a kilo. The Ceres Fish Cake Mix is the solution to increasing your profits on premium, premium products like fish. Why give customers more than they deserve or need and ruin your gross profits? You can trim the fish to the perfect weight and size and not worry about what to do with the trimmings. By making homemade fish cakes, you increase profits and sales at the same time. I know what you're thinking. Well, I can just use potatoes that I have for chips on site and boil them. Fact is, by the time we've even brought them to the boil, you'd be finished using the Ceres fish cake mix. We have put together so many recipes to get you started. You'd be crazy not to increase loyalty and profits by serving homemade fish cakes unique to your business. Increase your sales and profits today. Order the Serres Fish Cake Mix from worldofserres.com. It's always been my long-held belief that at every price level, customers get really passionate about great tasting food. Expertly cooked, of course. And when seafood is fresh and picked by an expert like Jimmy Buchan and his team at Amity Fish Company, you're halfway to getting people going crazy over great scampi. Scampi is often overlooked. Why not wow and delight your guests today by ordering from Amity Fish Company? Jimmy's hands-on approach ensures nothing slips under the net. Amity's dedicated team are focused on values of quality, sustainability, traceability and provenance, ensuring only the best Scottish catch will reach homes and businesses. Amity Fish Company is also proud to be an approved Marine Stewardship Council supplier keeping the chain of custody from sea to plate. Already supplying the offshore sector with MSC certified fish, Amity Fish Company is a great advocate of championing the Responsible Fishing Scheme, which is an industry-approved standard that vessels need to attain. Amity Fish Company provides an opportunity to seek and source your chosen seafood so that you have the confidence to promote the best Scottish seafood in your business. In buying into Amity, you are also buying into a wealth of experience. Let Amity take quality control like no other and guaranteed sustainability from shore to your door. Scampi doesn't have to be boring. Get in touch with Amity Fish today at amityfish.co.uk. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode with Lauren Heller as much as I did recording it. Do us a favour and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find us. Lauren Hiller, welcome to the Sarah's podcast. Hello, Celios. Thank you very much for having me back. Oh, no. I can't, what episode was it? Um, episode seven, I think. And um, you, what, I, you on 92 now, 91? Or, or have you just had 91? I think this one that we're recording right now is 94. 94, right. Okay, you've probably done a few behind the scenes before I've joined. How? I mean, I can't believe how many you've done in such a, a short space of time. And, and the, the breadth of people you've had on the podcast different opinions obviously super well received i always enjoy listening to them as well i can't believe i'm still in it if i'm honest like it's a lot of commitment <laughs> it's you know it's a lot of commitment and and uh, we took a little break over covid in about six seven weeks what i think keeps me going is because i love talking obviously as people Do know you? <laughs> but i also love le- i wouldn't have known that <laughs> i love learning I love learning about everything. And I've often said, I don't sit here as someone who knows everything. I'm on the journey. I think that's what podcasts are good for as well. I mean, like many people during the past year in lockdown, I've taken up a bit more running um, and I find music. I'm counting down the minutes of music because I know how my, how far I've got to go, for example, in a run. Whereas a podcast, it's sort of, it feels indefinite for, you know, it might be a 20 minute podcast, it might be an hour podcast. You can just keep on listening. You're not waiting for the end of a song. And you know, you're usually learning something as well. I feel like I take information in like that quite well. I'm not sure, you know, people learn differently, but for me, listening is quite a, an easy way to learn. I, I don't listen to podcasts when I'm running. No. Well, it's because I don't do running. You don't run? <laughs> I, had, I, had to, I had to throw that in there. I get that myself. <laughs> So look, <clears throat> one thing I tell a lot of people, I think that we're friends, yeah. So I'm not going to try to stitch you up because I don't stitch anybody up. The 94 mm-hmm. of these, well, this is number 94, and I've never stitched anybody up. But like I've said to a lot of people, everyone's got the right to reply. Everyone's got the right to, you know, to say their opinion or or their side of events. And and I think there's a lot going on. And actually, even if it wasn't for what we we're mostly going to talk about, I would have wanted to get you on anyway because. It's been such a long time anyway. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm glad you're not here to uh, stitch me up. It's always much appreciated. But I know I'm here to give a you know a fair, balanced, honest opinion. And I've said that to you before. Obviously, from an MSC perspective, that's who I work for. But just my own personal opinion too. You know, I'm passionate about what I do, the organisation I work for, the industry, you know, fish and chips, seafood, fishing in general. And yeah, that's that's me really, just here to, if you have so many different opinions on your podcast and you want to share that and learn and hopefully I can give a different perspective to things that perhaps you might not have heard about before. I think one of the things I liked about you from your original podcast is that, and I think a lot of people say it now, is that you gave the MSC opinion, but where you couldn't because you maybe didn't know the answer, you would then interject and say, look, this is what I think personally. And I think mm. I appreciated that. Yeah, I wish I was an expert across everything, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, not there yet. It's got a few more podcasts to listen to. <laughs> don't we all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Lauren, for those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and your day to day. Sure. So um, my name is Lauren Hiller. I'm Senior Commercial Officer at the MSC in the UK and Ireland team. So we're based at our head office in London. We're a regional team. So we're made up of commercial staff. That's you know the, the part of the team I'm in, uh, a fisheries outreach and communications and marketing. So we're a group of 10 in the UK. There are similar regional teams like us around the world who are, you know, trying to increase the amount of sustainable seafood, you know, in the market, you know, in restaurants and trying to raise awareness of the MSC, you know, try and increase people's understanding of what the logo is. So on a day to day, you know, like I said, my role is trying to increase the amount of sustainable seafood and and work with our teams to raise awareness of the MSC logo and work with our fisheries team you know in the UK to bring more fisheries into the program because of that market that market drive and market demand so yeah I work with a a group of very passionate people and for those who don't know who the MSC is with the Marine Stewardship Council 
Uh, we are an international non-profit organisation and what we do is we recognise and reward efforts to protect oceans and safeguard seafood supplies for the future. So our mission is to end overfishing and our vision is a world's oceans teeming with life and we do that through two different standards. So we've got our fishery standard which rewards sustainable fisheries and our chain of custody standard which is applicable all throughout the supply chain from perhaps where the pointless fish, fish has landed all the way up to where it's served in a restaurant or in a supermarket that seafood with the blue MSD label is sustainable. It's come from a well-managed fishery and it's fully traceable as well. So what you're getting, what they say you're getting is actually what you're getting. And um, so that's us in a little summary for those who don't know who we are or, or what we do. I guess so where sea fish will encourage people to eat seafood, MSC at the consumer level encourages consumers to eat certified seafood yes i guess so we obviously are we're a standard setting organization by so our, our originality that's we you know that's what we do so we you know want the world world world's oceans teeming with life and we want consumers to reward those fisheries which work really hard to operate sustainably and you know we know that consumers are wanting to know about more where their fish is where their fish has come from and food in general you've probably seen this over the last year as well people are really thinking about where their food comes from and that's what the msc logo can offer uh, is you know it's transparent it's credible and, and robust and consumers can be reassured that they are getting what they think they're getting yeah it was on the top of your game i like it i like it a lot. <laughs> What seas do you cover? Is that a sort of an after thing? Is that when a ship becomes certified? What, you know, is a bit chicken and egg. What sort of happens? Yeah, I mean, we don't cover a specific sea. We are a global organisation, so not limited to one area. I mean, we have fisheries certified all around the world. Asia, Australia, you know, the UK, Norway, Americas, going off the top of my head there. I think there's around 400 fisheries engaged in the programme. Um, so, yeah, we're not set to one specific area or, or one ship, any you know fisheries all around the world are certified to the standard as well. I mean, and also as well, you know, you mentioned, is it a ship that becomes certified? It's not just the size of a fishing boat alone or the scale does not determine whether it can fish sustainably. So any fishery can enter the programme with any gear type, um, excluding sort of dynamites and explosives. So it's, you know, it's not as specific as you might have mentioned, like one sea and one ship. It's we're a global organisation and we have, large scale fisheries in the program and we have small scale fisheries in the program we've got cotton haddock fisheries in the program clams and cockles we've got ling all fish you know such a variety of different species all around the world that are in the program i guess you yourself probably get a bit boxed into as far as i understand from your job role is you deal with the fish and chip sector so it's mostly cotton haddock in some ways isn't it it is yeah i guess so we all know that that is a very popular choice for a hungry family on a Friday night who are after a, a chippy supper but you know that you know, like I say sea fish do this as well they try and raise awareness of you know eating different species and I know you've raised this in your podcast before I was listening to one not long ago that you know in the UK we typically eat cod haddock you know the big the big five you know sometimes fish and chip shops are offering different things and people are becoming more adventurous so I don't think we're going to ever move away from cod and haddock I think that will it's a staple it's a you know a British thing people love it People are being more adventurous and wanting to try new things. I only know about the big five because of you. I just keep regurgitating it to make me sound clever. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean... but it's a difficult quandary. Like, again, it's chicken and egg. What makes I think what makes cod and haddock so popular, in my view, is that they are great species, you know, to eat. Mm -hmm. They're not overly flavoured, but, you know, they're, they're almost, especially if you look at cod, nice, thick, white flakes, but it is, it is the premium end of the fish. And yet I don't think it gets treated like it's the premium end of the fish, if that makes sense. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's one of those things you need to myth bust, isn't it? But because cod is an incredible bit of fish. And yeah, may, may, like you said, maybe people have got that opinion of it because it's tied to fish and chips. It's not a cheap fish. It's a premium fish. You know, there's such a massive demand for it. And the way like many fish and chip shops in the UK and restaurants as well treat it and serve it and make it super tasty. I've, I've said this before, you know, I didn't eat fish for about 15, 20 years. I blame, I, I think I said this on your last podcast, I blame it on my mum because I hated the way she cooked fish. I probably was just being a bit difficult when I was younger, but fish and chips got me back into eating fish again, like a good portion of fish and chips. Otherwise I wouldn't have gone near it because I was like, mm, no, I don't like fish. And that's 
you know, something we need to get over. <laughs> I've got no statistics to back this up, but it is a well-known fact that um, most people's first interaction with fish in the UK is through fish and shit. Um, mm. I'm sure someone like Seafish or MSC could get the real data there. I know my kids, their first interaction with fish is through fish and chips and and yet we do we well, actually not just that it's prawns at wagamama so i am you know so I am, oh, yeah fish fingers yeah but you know i think i probably fall into that box as well sometimes of only eating the big five but i do think maybe this is where sea fish could probably do more like and encourage fish and chip shops to try different white fish species even if it's just on the weekend or even on quiet days in the week i think it could be good especially if it gets people coming back to the the fish and chip shop or the restaurant twice people are willing to eat these different species in nice restaurants or what's perceived as a nice restaurant and because mm-hmm. fish and chip shops are nice restaurants too my friend's got a lovely fish and chip shop you can have hake there so why is it you can have hake there they wouldn't consider having it at home maybe i think people are still a few years on and i'm sure we probably discussed this last time that people are still a little bit scared to cook fish but i think things have changed over the last year you know on social media there's been lots of influencers and and chefs and restaurants giving out recipes doing online cooking tutorials and people have been following along and trying more adventurous things so I mean, my mum has started to cook a bit more fish at home. Like she'd always cook a bit of cod. She bought some lemon sole recently and did it. You know, she saw James Martin cooking it on Saturday morning kitchen. I was like, oh, I should definitely try that. And people people are becoming more adventurous across the board, across meat, fish, vegetables. I think it will come with time. I mean, we know during lockdown, seafood sales have been up, not just an MSE side, but I listened to, I joined a webinar long ago, not long ago and more people are eating fish because, you know, in peak lockdown, there was hardly any meat, was there? You know, the supermarkets were stripped bare so there was a bit more fish available frozen fish the canned canned tuna for example people coming a bit more adventurous and thinking right this is naturally too scary that is true and i think when you've got the time to get it right Mm -hmm. a friend of mine just he's got a fish and chip shop up north and he just texts me as we were setting up and he said he said oh can i ask you a question i said i've gone then he goes i said i'm just about to start a podcast so go on quickly sea fish have just sent him posters to promote fish and chips Mm -hmm. but think of the logic for a second they're to put in the shop. Well, do fish and chips need promoting in a fish and chip shop? Perhaps. I think people would normally go to fish and chip shops for fish, don't they? Yeah, no, I think that for, for me, the mistake there is that if you're going to promote fish and chips, you promote it to the people that don't eat fish and chips. Mm. Or, or and same, if you promote seafood, you promote it to those that don't eat seafood. Well, not necessarily, because people who eat fish, if you want them to try more fish and different species and there are there are key target audience because you want to be like incentivized to try different things you can't just exclude those people to say oh try more fish like what there might be one person who just eats prawns but what about hake what about cod what about monkfish what about cockles let's move on um sea spiracy how did it grind your gears how did it upset you well stelios i mean i was very disappointed with the execution of the documentary. I think we all were, you know, we've discussed this off this podcast as well. I think I don't disregard the issues that they've raised in the documentary, but when you try and simplify very complex issues, you are at risk of misrepresenting them and not telling, not necessarily telling the full truth, but getting the full picture. I mean, ultimately, not all fishing is bad and fishing is needed for people to survive you know livelihoods as a major source of protein you know we are we are a grown population we're lucky you and I that we're privileged enough that we can choose what we want to eat you know you can have prawns from wagamamas or you can have a nice steak from the butchers I can eat you know a vegetarian diet if I wanted to some people don't they don't have that choice so to have this you know over overarching narrative of eating fish is bad do not eat fish I think is very personally da- damaging and, and quite detrimental we can't disregard the issues that our oceans face but let's not also disregard the hard work that's gone on in the industry the whole seafood industry the whole globally there's been so much progress as, that has been made and we shouldn't disregard it I mean what do you think what did you think about the documentary were you offended by it upset no, no I don't think I was offended by it I wasn't upset the film itself if I'm honest, that it felt like I think I, I think I told you this, it, and I've said it on the podcast since. It felt like a thriller. It felt like I was watching something. That my analogy was when they build 
shopping centers, like shopping malls. They they build it so that you have a um like a, a disorientated sense of direction, so that you actually feel like you're in a state of alarm. So then your normal purchasing patterns don't apply because your mm-hmm. brain is thinking about something else. It's the same that when you sleep in hotel rooms, you don't have a good night's sleep because your brain is thinking, I'm not safe here. It's not my home. And I think they use very similar tactics to ramp us up so that when they started throwing out all the all the information, I don't want to say facts because some of it has been massively discredited. So when they started throwing out all these big statements, bold statements, blood everywhere, I think your brain is literally just like, oh my God, it's got to be true. And it gives you this, this sense of outrage. And and I know people that validly feel outraged after watching it. And that's okay, like because it's not nice seeing the grind, for example. It's not nice, but there is a reason. Yeah, I do think that for me, I felt like they played a bit fast and loose with the with the uh I don't know, with the the, the performance, let's say. Um that that's my so I don't think I was upset. I just felt like they were a bit a bit over the top with it. And that could have done them some detriment, if I'm honest. Yeah. I think it's important to you know, make people aware of the issues. Perhaps that wasn't, I mean, I personally don't think that was the right way to go about it. I think what the documentary has done is really made people think about where their food comes from. That I don't genuinely think people knew that their fillet of fish that they got in the supermarket or at a fish and chip shop comes from a fishery and there's people actually on a boat fishing. I, I, there are some people who don't know where their food comes from. Same with like fruit and veg. They're, it just appears in the supermarket and happy days. They go home and cook it. A few years ago when I worked for my dad, a, a girl, I, I don't remember, but I remember the story. And um, she says, oh, that fish that was in the tray. I was like, yeah. She goes, I don't get it. She goes, what do you mean? What don't you get? She goes, how does it look when it's not like that? And I was like, what do you mean? I said, she, she couldn't understand how to articulate it. But she'd never seen a fish before. She'd heard a fish and seen fish, but she couldn't match the two in her brain. Mm. And that's just, well, there's skin on it. There's bone in the middle. There's two fillets and there's a head and a tail and fins. And she was like, oh, my God, that, that can't be real. And I was like, no, it's fish. Like, it's fish. Like, you know, she, But again, like, that's not to mock her. She just didn't no. know. Like she did not know. And I think and I think maybe a lot of consumers are blind to where all of their food comes from, whether it's meat, whether it's vegetables, whether it's seafood. And I think a lot of people are pretty. And I think we do look the other way because we all feel uncomfortable, whichever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think meat eaters do it. Fish eaters do it. Vegans do it. They all look the other way because it suits their narrative. Yeah. Again, I think it sort of goes back to we're very lucky that we can do that research and we can know about where our you know find a bit more about where our food come from comes from and make and make those informed choices i mean ultimately i think our best chance of making our food systems more sustainable is by engaging with you know producers and creating markets for more sustainable products at the expense of their less sustainable competition so you know sometimes you might go into a supermarket and there might be an organic pot of tahini and it's four pounds or I don't know and people you know want to do the right thing but when you're in a supermarket and you're on that at that purchasing level level you might not regardless of whether you really care or not sometimes you might go for the cheaper the cheaper option really I think and that's a that's a difficult one I think we can't label all animal agriculture you know you know fish farming wild fishing you know or seafood as evil you know it, we're missing a huge opportunity here to make you know an important part of almost everyone's diet more sustainable you know regardless of what you eat if you're a meat eater a fish eater or you're a plant-based diet or you're a vegan we need to have sustainable systems because we're only getting bigger you know or, well, not we're <laughs> you know, am i getting bigger maybe after lockdown but as a you know population and, and globally we are growing and we need sustainable food systems to feed a growing population. I think I agree with that. I think, I, I, and I do think that they probably, and I, whether they care or not is a different story, but I do think the filmmakers, they went too far in a lot of the shock tactics. And I think that because of that, people that influence these policies will look at it and just dis- disregard lots of what they said that could have been valid. And I think, and I think for me, this is what made me think, de- I didn't feel like it was a documentary. I felt like it was, I don't like the word, but I did feel like it was a bit propagandist. Like it was there to sort of move us over to a different way of eating. Like For example, I think I was saying just before we were setting up, Oceana, the charity that was in the film, they're trying to pass a bill in America to stop plastic waste entering um, the seas. 
and, and you know, and it's cost them a lot of money, and yet it was never mentioned. And you think, well, their issue was that plastic enters the sea. You think you'd at least mention it that this charity, but instead they made the charity look like knobs. And you think if they really cared about what was they were really doing, they would have had a more diverse opinion, balanced opinion. Their opinion is that we should not eat fish and the only way to save the oceans is to stop eating fish entirely. So why would you if you if you're of if you're of that opinion, why would you bring all the good things that are happening to light when your your opinion and your agenda is that right, that's the only way we can save the ocean is to stop eating fish. Unfortunately, that's not the solution. I think a lot of people know that, um, you know, deep down, like you said, the documentary was quite scary in parts and alarmist and, oh, yeah, yeah, some not very nice footage, but we need fish and I don't think that's the answer. Apparently, I didn't realise this, but apparently three billion people in the world depend on seafood for their everyday diet not because they fancy nice prawns or premium cod or whatever it may be just because they need to eat yeah i mean i can't remember the um exact stat but i know yeah it's in the billions that people rely on fish as their main source of protein and with that that people rely on fisheries and aquaculture as a livelihood as well so it's, it's twofold it's a food source a very important food source and also livelihood as well if you just stripped fishing out I'm like no we're not doing any fishing then what do you do with all the people who rely on that for their livelihood fishermen and women all around the world producers processors suppliers what do you do my hypothesis is if you stop rearing animals let's say for consumption their argument is they would flourish and they would you know they would like roam in the wild well the fact is farmers wouldn't care anymore like in India where they're even celebrated you see cows on the side of a road until they die that would happen in the UK they just no, no farmer's going to say, yeah, I'm keeping them now because I like to have 40 cows eating grass and costing me money when I don't need them. What would it, what if we flip that hypothesis to the sea for a split second? Like what happens to the oceans if no one ever fishes the sea? And can you even stop people from fishing the sea? I don't, I mean, I don't think you can ever stop people, can you? Common area for a start, isn't it? Yeah. And again, it goes back, Stelios, to that point of... People need fishing to survive. I I watched um, a, a documentary on on YouTube about some you know small scale fishery in in Thailand. And during COVID, they didn't have a market because of COVID, and the impact that that had on their their livelihoods and their life and their family. They couldn't send their children to school. It's there's there's just there's such a like um what's that phrase I'm looking for domino effect when you make a decision at one level if you don't you know, fully assess the impact as a whole. And there's so many things and it's all intertwined. There's so many different things involved. I, I just think the overarching message of the documentary wasn't great. And we can do so we can do so much better than that to shed a light on the great work that's been doing, that has been, you know, done and that can be done in the future too. You could never ban it, nor should it ever be banned. Because again, so many people feed off it. But how, it just makes you wonder if they reproduce as fast as they do. Because you know, when you've had like a, a fishery that's crashed, mm -hmm. it doesn't take long, maybe seven years for that, you know, lots of care and effort for that fishery to be looked after, doesn't it? I mean, it depends on the fishery and the species. And, you know, it's not just seven years. I mean, let's go back to, you know, a hundred or so years ago when the MSC sort of, well, we were founded in 1997. But the main cause of our our founding was the collapse of the Grand Bank's cod fishery in the eastern coast of Canada. And that was once a very, you know, in the 1900s, a very, very popular fishery, popular and sustainable. There was lots of fish and it was, you know, doing doing really well because of overfishing and the introduction of industrial fishing vessels. And they weren't really sure of the change in the environment. That, that fishery collapsed. And still to this day, it's still not fully you know, recovered to once what it was, it dropped to like 1% of its levels in 1900, you know, compared to 1990, it dropped to that 1% of what it was. So fisheries take, it's still trying to recover. And that was what, 30 years ago, it did. There's so many, you know, different factors, you know, and the, the great thing about our oceans is that if we manage fish stocks sustainably, they can recover and thrive. That's, that's the important thing. You know, sustainable fishing is all about taking a long-term view to manage in our oceans. So we leave enough fish in our oceans so that fish populations can remain productive and healthy. You know, our oceans can thrive and we need to work collaboratively, you know, with our oceans as well to bring some stocks back 
you know, from the brink. Um, I don't know if you heard the podcast with Jim and Ashley uh, Coey, but why are gill nets bad? What is it I don't know about gill nets? Well, I don't think any gear type is specifically good or bad. bad. Okay. Regardless of, you know, any gear type can be bad if not correctly managed. I think that's probably a gear, a gill net can be bad. Long line can be bad. Trawling can be bad. Pole the line can be bad. A range of gears are used in commercial fishing and each type of gear has some effect on the ocean environment one way or another. However, again, similar to, you know, sustainable fishing, if managed carefully, you know, virtually all gear types can be used responsibly and sustainably. And, you know, going back to when I introduced the MSC earlier, we don't, uh, any gear type is welcome in the programme apart from explosives and poison um, and any fishery catching fish in the wild can be assessed to our standards. So, I yeah, I... Gill net, gill nets can be bad. Like I said, anything can be bad if not you know, done properly or, or well managed, I think. What they were probably referring to more so is the fact that they were saying, I probably didn't know enough about it at the time, um, but they were saying that plastic gill net get dumped or left behind or in their waters. They pick them up mm-hmm. and bring them back and they're saying that animals can get caught in them. I guess nets and nets, whatever you say. I guess plastic is used because it, I guess it's stronger than rope. Mm -hmm. And I guess perhaps, I don't know. I don't know the answer because I've never made them before. I'm thinking thinking of an example. So there is the Cornish hake fishery, I was going to say in Cornwall. Um, And that's an MSC certified fishery. That is a gill net fishery. Um, And that's been certified for many years now. And they've made many improvements to the way they fish to, I think they, what they did was reduce, increase the size of the mesh so that the smaller fish could swim through. So in order to catch less juveniles and only catch the bigger hake. So that's an example there. And with that as well, there is a company, I can't remember the name of the company. They recycle um, the Cornish hake fishery nets into sort of 3D things. I've seen that. Fishing nets. And we actually did that for our MSC UK awards last year, the awards were made out of the fishing nets from the Cornish Hake fishery. So a full circular economy. And um, so again, so I, was, I, was just, you know, I, I, I said this before and I'll say this again, anything can be done badly if not well managed, regardless of it's fishing, if it's gardening or cooking, if it's not done well, then you might have a bad result. Oh, one thing I couldn't get my head around in the film was shark finning. It just struck me as the, it's almost like the most horrific thing you could do to an animal. You cut off the three or four fins that a shark has, then lob it back in the water and it can't swim. It just falls to the bottom and dies. Slow death. Is that not pretty much what they what happens? I get Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not an expert in it. It's an, an abhorrent you know, practice. It's It really is awful. I think, you know, why it still happens is that shark fin soup well shark fins are still viewed as a delicacy and a status symbol yeah, yeah. Um, obviously you have shark fin soup or perhaps you know eaten at posh events or or weddings that maybe um I, I don't think apparently the shark fins actually themselves don't taste of anything apparently not yeah it's only the taste that comes from the broth but i think the texture of the shark fin is what people like and the fact that it is a luxury item um and it's a way of showing perhaps wealth and status by ordering, you know, the most expensive item. I don't agree that it still happens, but a number of countries do have anti-shark finning legislation, but many don't. And enforcement can be, you know, a challenge, you know, across, you know, across the world. Why can't they just do what they did with ivory? Why can't they make it illegal to sell it in stores? And then that sort of gets rid of the issue. I, I wish I knew the answer to that, Stelios. Uh, yeah, no, no, sorry. It was just like a little, I, know, I, was just, I was just thinking about that. Like that can be your on your to-do list for tomorrow if you go and find out why. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But like, no, like it just it just seemed like an, uh, an also a huge waste of food. But then I, when I looked up on it as well, it said that you probably shouldn't eat shark anyway because it would be probably full of mercury anyway. Because apparently they're, the way that they're, their fat is it apparently absorbs a lot of that same with dolphins and whale apparently so no one should be eating that apparently yeah I, i'm not a health expert but i understand this is a function of the food chain and mercury can concentrate in the bodies of fish and shellfish so species that are long lived and high on the food chain such as tuna sharks swordfish they may contain higher concentrations of mercury than others as it accumulates in their body over time not not too sure on on the details 
to to be honest with you. It's just abhorrent. I just don't understand how, you know, they could do that. But Yeah, I think it's a global challenge as well for the fishing industry, you know, governments and conservationists. It's not something that's going to go away tomorrow. The demand for fins puts sharks at massive risk still from overfishing. And there are millions and millions of sharks which are caught every year, which might end up in, which do end up in the shark fin trade, which is really awful. I, I was trying to think of an example earlier. You know, it's it's a luxury item. It's obviously very different, but I think you know, foie gras, I, I personally would never eat that. I don't believe in... And I think this is why it's slightly different, because you don't kill a duck just for the foie gras. Like and then lob it in on the ground and walk away. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I get what you're saying. That the act of making foie gras is again not very nice. Um, mm-hmm. I have eaten it in the past. I've not not eaten it in a long time. Um, but you can get ethical foie gras now. Like again, not like. And I guess I, I don't know if they eat as much as what they did before. Um, yeah. yeah. Like you know, I guess pretty much they don't. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I think they're slightly different. Um, but yeah, I get what you're saying. Like, I don't think I'd ever eat shark fin soup either, to be honest. It doesn't feel like it's up my street. No, it doesn't feel. I don't think it'd be my um, my first menu choice item if I was on a desert island. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you can eat it over here anyway, though, can you? I think it is massively illegal over here, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. I think, again, look, it's the same in Cyprus. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of songbirds. They're these little birds. They've become a delicacy. They were always a bit of a delicacy because they were ultra seasonal. So, but what people mm-hmm. do is get like branches of stick and make like this really thick glue, which is basically made out of sugar syrup. And then they dip the stick in it and then they put the stick on the trees. And then when the birds sit on them, they catch them. Oh. Yeah. And it's a very gruesome way to die, if you imagine, because you can't you can't fly away. You just basically die a slow death, like you know. Yeah. So it's now illegal to do this in Cyprus. But let's say, I don't know, 20 years ago to buy a dozen, it would have cost, I don't know, a couple of quid. Yeah. Now yeah. 90 euros, a hundred euros, because it still happens, but it's just drove the price through the roof. I guess their argument is, well, this is our this is our delicacy. You yeah. Know? I don't eat them, but yeah, I don't really like them. They just, they just, there's no flavour there. But yeah, it's sort of hard to change like people's perception and understanding of perhaps the greater issues as well. And like you said, it's it's a delicacy, and that's what they're perhaps used to eating traditionally, and very hard to pull them away from something they know and have known for such a long time. Yeah, what's going on with the bycatch situation? Is that as bad as what they said, or is it getting better? You know, what sort of controls go into it? So, again, this is what I sort of referred to earlier. Um, There are issues globally in the fishing industry, overfishing, illegal fishing, unregulated fishing, bycatch, um, shark finning. The the, the things that they have addressed in the documentary are are, are not things that are new. But as I said, you, you can't, you know, tarnish the global fishing industry with the same brush. There are there are cases of bad things happening across the world. It's the same with any industry. I think if we look at sort of um, MSC fisheries, fisheries that are certified to the MSC standard, they must provide evidence that they are, that they are actively minimising unwanted catch. So that's also known as bycatch. Um, and that fisheries, the need to improve this in this area are set goals that they must meet to keep their certificates or risk being suspended. So when a fishery is certified to the MSC standard, sometimes they are, um, sometimes conditions are placed on the fishery that so they have to make the necessary improvements to to up their score, basically. And sometimes fisheries are given conditions on that to try and reduce their impact in one way or another. You know, bycatch can be a problem when endangered, threatened and protected species, you know, are accidentally caught, injured or killed. And, you know, another problem associated with bycatch includes disrupting the food chain by, you know, taking fish that other fish rely on as food. And bycatch can reduce the population of a fish species to a point where it's very difficult to replenish. So this can happen when a fishing gear isn't designed to allow juvenile fish to swim free and, you know, breed and and grow again. So responsible, well-managed fisheries will actively and proactively reduce their bycatch. Like I said, it does it does happen. It's not it's not a problem that we don't disregard. But fisheries that are certified to the standard are are actively working against that. I guess when you put. A big net down 
you are going to catch unintended species. You can't do anything about that, can you? But we, or you can. I guess you can do things about it. And I guess there's things I don't even know that they do to minimise it. Well, I guess the question is, well, a question, a question that could be asked is, what is an, an what is an acceptable level of bycatch? So, an acceptable level of bycatch varies depending on where in the ocean it's being caught and on the species. So, for example, even if the level of bycatch is very low. It could be that the species is endangered and therefore that level of bycatch is deemed too high. So some fish can be returned to the sea alive in an effort to manage bycatch. And lots of fisheries are trying to reduce their impact and reduce bycatch. Bycatch can be reduced through certification to the MSC fishery standard. You know, fishery in you know, a fishing activity is often, you know, often improved during and after, after certification, what I just mentioned before. Lots of improvements can be made, contributions to research, modifications to their gear types, their fishing methods, or methods to or methods and measures to build up fish populations as well. So I, I, I'll probably keep going back to this point. We can't disregard the issues that we face, but people, you know, there are fisheries which are making a difference and really trying to improve their practice and operate sustainably and you know operate as a well-managed fishery. I think one of the things that I feel as consumers we do and it goes back to sort of the film to some degree is the plastics issue. I know mm -hmm. we don't have control over where plastic goes. Once I put it in my recycle bin, I genuinely don't know what happens. I don't think anybody does. And I will say that I remember reading an article again, just on a slight tangent. And it says recycling bins should be banned from the office because when there's recycling bins in the office, people waste paper, they waste materials and if you basically just had small bins and you said like waste less he did a test this guy did he put recycling bins and he noticed that the paper consumption went up and it, because people thought well i can recycle it now mm. and it did make me think like if people just were better at getting rid of things and i do think that's the same with councils like if they did better repurposing certain things you know recycling and so on what you know and the government needs to take control here like they need to say we're banning the export of used plastic maybe put like a subsidy on reusable plastics because i just don't it, the problem doesn't seem to be going away we've been talking about this for a few years you've enlightened me plenty on it and and i just feel like it just seems to be lingering i was having a conversation with a friend about this and how because we've got a, i can see a recycling bin from where i'm sitting with like cardboard and, and plastic in there. And I said, you know, the sheer amount of recycling that I get through is incredible sometimes. Why do I, I, I try and actively minimise my waste and, you know, I try and be considerate and try and buy plastic free and whatnot. But it all comes down to so many things are covered in materials. You know, if you go back to <laughs> way back when, if you went to a market, you wouldn't buy something in a plastic pot or, wrapped in polystyrene or you know cling film or, or whatnot it, it was just sort of there you put it in your bag and and you went home whereas now everything is covered in plastic really and I, I don't think you know a question I thought to myself earlier will the damage of single-use plastics last forever there's been a massive impact from covid you know with plastic you know the reusable not the the, the, the disposable masks the, the masks that are used one time coffee cups you know more things for testing it's all plastic isn't it but will that impact last time I feel like we're making good progress but will what do you think will they, are we going to make any progress in are we going to go back to where we came from I think we've gone backwards I think we've gone backwards I think all governments have kicked the can down the road and I feel that like you said everything is covered with plastic even bio packaging and i'm doing my quote fingers for example one of the most popular packaging types in our industry now is bagasse it's made out of sugar cane mm -hmm. do you know what it is when it's finished it's a bioplastic it's a plastic made from sugar cane not being funny lauren what's the difference between a bioplastic made from sugar cane and a plastic made from crude oil they both end up being a very similar product you started with yeah a different ingredient but your end product is very similar. And then you've got all the paper pots that are covered in PLA, which is basically a bio version of cling film, which can't be recycled. Mm -hmm. When you find out that councils don't even recycle them, they don't even put them in the composter, they just go into general waste. And these things can't be, they, they, they go to landfill. I feel like we've just replaced one plastic with another plastic. That's what I feel like we've done. And, and we've called it, 
bioplastic or plant plastic or or, or bio packaging or whatever. You know, one of the other things as well with the bagasse packaging, if you do a bit of research, there's real issues with um, the way it's sourced and slave labor and um, and a lot of pesticides that are used on um, growing sugar cane. Just feel like we've done a disservice here because instead of taking the time to really look at the issue, a lot of people have just rushed into something else thinking it because, again, they've n- no malice here. No one's done it on purpose. Like, you know, your, your, your local takeaway of whatever type hasn't done it because they think they're fiddling the system. They've genuinely done it because they feel like they want to do better. Mm. And it it really gets to that next stage of the business has made a really good decision, you know, because they're thinking about the future. But perhaps if it if it is that you know bioplastic that you've just referred to, then how what do I do with it as a consumer? Yeah. I you know I want to be making the right decision. But then you can't. I can't. You can't. It's futile. It's, it's, you know, and this is why I say the government have to step in and the government have to say if it's polystyrene, for argument's sake, we can recycle it. We can reuse it. We can dispose of it properly. If it's bagasse, again, the same thing. The councils need to start, in my view, being forced to use this packaging rather than just lobbing it in landfill, you know. I don't know. That's my thought. I think we could be a bit more educated on it as well. I I know I'm not fully up to date with what things are. Your league, your leagues ahead than most. You tell me about it all the time. Perhaps you walk around with your own water bottle. I do. I do indeed. Um, I'm just always very thirsty. Uh, no, but you know, because new things come into your shopping basket all the time, and I look at things, and it has little symbols on it, and it doesn't make it easy. You do, we just need a can recycle, can't recycle. But then I understand there are, it's more complicated than that because some can be recycled. But, you know, I've got a recycling in a, in a little station in the car park not far from where I live. Um, but some of the things I think can be recycled can't be recycled there. I might have to take it to the dump and there's another section for it. It's really I think it's, I think, I think it's called the recycling centre. The recycling no, The dump. <laughs> the dump has been recycling. Something, that's something I'd say, <laughs> Lauren. I can't believe You've just stole one of my words. No. You're meant to be like on this podcast. You're the brains, okay? Like you can't say words like that. Okay, I'm so no. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I just think, I just think, for the most part, uh, you know, especially over COVID, takeaway consumption has probably gone up, and so, and um, actually, by the nature of COVID, so has cooking at home. Mm-hmm. You know, so both both consumptions have gone up. I just think the landfill must be teeming with shit because it is literally going to be full of crap now. Like that, that cannot be recycled. And I think going back to all those years ago when you go to the butchers and you get your beef wrapped in wax paper, you could just get that wax paper and put it in the bin, and it wouldn't take long for that to rot and just become part of nature. But I do think some of these these new packagings, just for our industry specifically, and actually if we look at supermarket packaging, I feel that supermarket packaging is designed to keep food on the shelf for longer. That, that's forget what they say, like it, that is really its main priority. Well that's where it's all come from the the plastic packaging and and packaging in general is to preserve these items. Yeah. You know, and that's that's not no, that's nothing new, is it? Uh, I know that the, but again, some supermarkets have made commitments to try and phase out you know, black plastic and you know unrecyclable packaging, and that you know things that are held in plastic will either be made of recyclable packaging or they will be recyclable by twenty twenty five, for example. Um, I think people are you know making the right progress. Yeah, I think Maybe, so. But there are, you know, they're massive supply chains and these things can't happen overnight. One last point on um on, on Seaspiracy, although we took a slight tangent. One last point I'd say is, you know, we need I need to say it because that is that whole 2048 message, you know, fish and chip, um, sorry, seafood won't exist by 2048 in the seas. Mm-hmm. That guy, the guy who wrote it, have you heard about him or read about him? Yeah, so it was a it was based on a, if I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, 2006, 2006. Yes. Of which the the person who wrote the paper has retracted what he said. He retracted it himself in two thousand and nine. It's a debunked statistic. Yeah, and and I'm yeah, sure you can agree with him. That why why are we still why yeah. complain out of this? Because we've seen so much press. I know I, I you know you shared articles with me. I shared articles with you. We've seen a lot of this. I'm doing your quote thing this here. The reality check and the fact checking that the a lot of you know. A lot of the things that were said in the documentary weren't technically correct, similar to cowspiracy. 
that some of the science in there perhaps wasn't necessarily true and, and a little bit misleading. And I think that's really disappointing. Again, I go back, I'm coming back full circle. I think we, you know, we had that opportunity to really address these issues and tackle them head on and highlight the work that's been done and the work that hasn't been done and can be done. This is not the best way to go about it, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. How can consumers know or guarantee that and I, I guess it's not an issue for over here, but and I guess BRC accreditation would deal with this somewhat. Um, how can they guarantee that seafood has um hasn't been affected by slave labour? Are you talking about um marine MSC seafood or seafood in general? I guess, I guess all seafood, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'll go back. Do you guys, does MSC have a provision for that? So, you know, as a start, the MSC completely condemns the use of forced labor yeah. child labour. And we, we completely recognise the social, the importance of social issues when considering sustainability. So we support the global efforts of towards the eradication of forced and child labour in fisheries and, and seafood supply chains. And I think recognise the urgency in addressing forced and, and child labour violations. So we have taken steps to mitigate the risk of forced um uh, or child labour in certified seafood supply chains. Um, and we do require that fisheries improve transparency around their labour practice. So our labour policies have been, uh, as many, you know, a lot of the work, all of the work that we do has been underpinned by stakeholder consultations, um, including the four full public consultations with over 300 organisations. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, we are an environmental standard setter and our mission is to end overfishing and you know, have the world's oceans teeming with life. Um, so we, we currently do not have the expertise or remit to provide a social, a standard for social welfare for fisheries and the seafood supply chain. But we encourage our partners to provide assurance through relevant labour schemes. So we're always keen to share our experiences and expertise with those interested in you know, developing a social welfare standard. Standard, I guess that's where it comes back to the, you know, the MSC chain of custody. It's a, a traceability and segregation standard. So you know the way your fish has come from and you can you, you know, be reassured that your fish has come from a sustainable, well-managed fishery and that there isn't, you know, forced or child labour in, in, in the seafood supply chain. I suppose, that it's not, like you say, if you've not got the remit, you can't force people to do it, but, you, you know, you make it clear that it is not tolerated and that's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's hard. And I, I think sometimes people expect the MSC to be everything to everyone. Um, and we can't, unfortunately, solve everything, you know. They want that because I, I don't blame them to some degree because they pay you. They don't want to pay someone else and someone else and someone else. I can see why to some degree. And there are organisations with better expertise yeah. than us in these things. Yeah, 100%. You know, I, I, I go, we were obviously we're just talking about, you know, o, uh, you know, plastic and, you know, ocean plastic pollution is a global threat and it's a very serious issue. But this is, it's one thing that a group, one group can't solve alone you know we need to prevent plastic pollution from getting in the ocean in the first place so we have a role in combating ocean plastics you know fisheries that are certified to the standard we they reduce their ghost gear so that's all the low, you know loss and abandoned fishing gear but we can't cover everything i remember i think i don't remember exactly but when we did our podcast back then i think i said something like that i think it was like um um 90 percent of the the world's plastic pollution enters the sea through seven uh rivers and i think they were all in asia i think well, i remember like, you and, that article you yeah, shared for me yeah yeah and but it, it, you know I'll, I'll i'll try and put a link to it to be more accurate obviously and i'm not asking for an accurate answer to this but like has any of that changed have those countries that have been doing it said oh no we're not going to do it anymore like or does it still just end up back there is is what is in that pacific garbage patch still the same or is it constantly being added to is what i'm getting at. and again i know it's a personal opinion more than a, a an msc opinion i get that well i think there there was a claim in the documentary wasn't there that isn't 40 percent or 46 percent of the great pacific garbage patch it's a bit of a tongue twister that isn't it we discarded fishing gear um and i think while the claim is that 46 percent of pacific great garbage patch is fishing gear comes from a it comes from a credible uh paper in nature the authors indicate that this is quite a bit of uncertainty and the model uh, is from a lower observed figure of 17.9 percent of fishing waste and a I think I've also read that the UN FAO estimates that 10% of marine waste comes from the fishing industry. 
which is likely to be more representative of the global situation as opposed to that one study in that one Pacific garbage patch. That's a tongue twister to get out. So the great Pacific garbage, pa garbage patch is a you know important reminder that there is issues with plastics and that you know plastics can cause great harms in our oceans. But again, it's not, I think, fully representative. Have you seen that? Have you heard of that Boyan Slat? No. Ocean Cleanup Project. Oh, yeah. So a guy called Boyan Slat, he runs the Ocean Cleanup Project. Mm -hmm. And um, he's created like lots of machines, like rigs to just clear up the sea. And I was thinking to myself, like, why hasn't every government like said, you know what, we've got a bit of spare cash. Yeah. Oh, if they have after COVID, I don't know. But let's say before, why did they say, look, here's a hundred grand, mate. Everyone, like, why is it not a priority of governments? Like, it doesn't, like, this is a shared planet. We all, we're all here. But like, I just don't, I, I, when you see that, and they say you can actually see it on Google Earth, they say, um, I think they say it's that, that the, what did you call it? The Great Pacific, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. <laughs> yeah. So they say you can actually, it's that big. You can actually see it from Google Earth, apparently. Mm -hmm. So it does make you wonder why no one's made it a priority to get it clean. I just don't get it. And obviously, yeah, that's just an opinion. I'm not looking for an, you know, professional opinion. It just doesn't, it strikes me as odd that it's there and everyone just sort of keeps skirting around it. Like, it's almost like if you touch it, you own it. I wonder if it's a bit like that. Perhaps, but there's a lot of things that we need to address and they aren't unfortunately tackled. So, no. Tell me about FIPS. FIPS. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about FIPS. So we've, we've segued. We really have segued, haven't we? So, I, mean, I wanted to keep you. On, I wanted about, to keep you on your toes, Lauren. Want to keep you on my toes. So, what do you want to know about FIPS? Well, a chap messaged me earlier and said about it it just said it's a good initiative and wanted to know a little bit more about it sure yeah so a FIP another acronym um is a fishery improvement project so there is increasing market demand for sustainable seafood which has led to you know considerable growth of fishery improvement projects FIPS um and you know the MSC supports credible FIPS um and what FIPS are they are multi-stakeholder initiatives that aim to help fisheries work towards sustainability and we we believe that it's important that FIPS are transparent, um, they demonstrate measurable improvement and are and are operated in a credible manner. Um, so if you look on the MSC website, there are we have a, a you know definition of a credible FIP. So that is um completion of an MSC pre-assessment, development of an improvement action plan, regular reporting on progress, a mechanism to independently verify progress. A clear timeline with an end date, genuinely not exceeding five years, and commitment to MSC certification. So we actually have, um, there's a project in the UK, it's called Project UK, um, and it supports fisheries across the United Kingdom working towards an environmentally sustainable future. So it's a collaboration between the fishing industry, scientists, non-governmental organisations, NGOs, and the seafood supply chain. So you know, we know that fish in the UK is quite varied. It's made up of a diverse range of species, vessels, fishing gears. Um, and there are, you know, lots of, like I said, lots of fisheries, lots of vessels working towards, um, you know, getting lots of fish onto the into the UK market and abroad as well. So we, Project UK actually builds on a project, called, a project called Project Inshore, in which sea fish and the MSC mapped around 450 English fisheries. And, the MSC's pre-assessment tool was used to identify improvements needed for these fisheries to become sustainable. So representatives from across the supply chain came together to build on the findings from Project Inshore um, and help these fisheries to make improvements needed to meet, to meet the standard. You know, there are lots of fisheries globally who might not be at the MSC level, but entering a, a fishery improvement project, a credible one, allows them to, you know, work towards MSC certification. It's credible, it's tra transparent. There is, like I said, there's an action plan they can work towards that. Um, and specifically with Project UK, we are supporting 12 fisheries in eight fishery improvement projects. They are multi-stakeholder initiatives that help fisheries work towards sustainability. So Project UK is supporting 12 fisheries in eight fishery improvement projects. And they are, like I said before, multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder initiatives that help fisheries work towards sustainability. So these FIPS cover a range of target species, different gear types, locations, uh, fishery sizes, and they were chosen because of you know different things: the commercial, 
benefits, the economic benefits, cultural benefits that they bring to communities within the UK. So the project is quite a few years old now. So the first six FIPS were launched in 2017, Channel Scallop, Southwest Crab, Southwest Lobster, Southwest Monkfish, North Sea Place and then the Seoul, and then two further FIPS joined Project UK in 2019. So Scallop and Nephrops or Scampi um, fisheries in the North Sea, West of Scotland and the Irish Sea, just making sure I get everything right there if I told you everything. Um, and yes, yeah, like I said, Nephrops are also known as Scampi or the Norway Lobster or Langoustine. And, you know, these FIPS are addressing many different actions to achieve environmental sustainability. And this involves meeting multiple milestones across a five year period to reach global best practice. So each fish has a each FIP has a dedicated steering group. And these have a, a range of stakeholders from different sectors providing support and expertise. So it's quite an interesting product, you know, uh, project. Our, our fisheries team have really, you know, have made really great progress. And these fisheries are important to the UK market and globally as well. You know, there are lots of there are some UK retailers involved in Project UK who are keen to see these fisheries operate sustainably so that perhaps they can source them as well. So more British fish entering the UK seafood supply chain. I was going, you know, listening to your podcast before, um, I think it was episode 91, um, there was a comment that, you know, there are no fish counters open in UK retailers anymore, which isn't true. Um, you know, you've got... I think that I think that's the general feeling. Like, general feeling, it's not yeah. true though. Um, your Tesco's think, don't have them anymore, do they? I think Morrison's yeah. do. You know, Tesco's do, Sainsbury's have closed them, Waitrose yeah. their counters, Morrison's. I just to have... Fish counters. Um, I'm not too I sure. But, I don't have one near me. But no. lots of retailers are sourcing more British species than ever before. Cornish sardines, Cornish hake, Shetland mussels, um, Paul Harbour clam and cockles. That was uh, that. They're now being sold in in Waitrose. So that was that's a small scale fishery in the southwest in Paul Harbour, who <laughs> whose fish or well, the clams and cockles would usually go out to you know high end Michelin star restaurants and people would eat them there and. Waitrose took them on during COVID, you know, sort of as a lifeline really for the fishery. And they're being sold now on the fish counter. And I've been at home, they're nice. Get, let's move away from retail for a moment. You know, I was with a, a chef yesterday and he's in Port Isaac. And he says, you know, he goes and buys his fish from the fishermen who land it in Port Isaac. They've got an eight metre boat. There's two or three guys on a boat. That's classed as unsustainable although all the species they bought were pretty sustainable. And he's saying that those fishermen wouldn't be able to be MSC certified because it might be a bit costly for them or a bit too much. You know, how how do you then deal with the micro scale? Uh, yeah, that, this is a, a question which is, you know, has been raised and, and you know, the MSC, you know, only large scale fisheries are certified to the MSC standard. That's not true. I just refer to Paul Harbour clam and cockles that's a small scale fishery that's they're defined as small scale um but we recognize that there are challenges in you know small scale fisheries showing their sustainability and becoming certified and we want to make sure that all fisheries regardless of size and location can use the MSE fishery standard and operate sustainably as well um like i said there are challenges to certification um you know we're committed to you know our we're committed to helping them with this. We have an ambition to grow, um, you know, for more than a, a third of the global marine catch to be engaged with our programme by 2030. Unfortunately, small scale fisheries that are, you know, can be well managed, but they may lack the, the scientific data needed to demonstrate sustainability. This can include uh, data on stock status estimates, impacts on large, on target species and habitats. And with the fishery standard, fisheries may also be need, may also need to make improvements to their environmental performance too. So that's before they can meet our sustainability requirements. And again, this can be challenging when they have limited management capacity or financial resources. Uh, and again, some fisheries, you know, second to that, may also find it difficult to, to adopt sustainable fishing practice because of lack of technical capacity, you know, insufficient support or limited engagement by supply chain and local markets. And that's one thing that, you know, we will continue to work on. You know, we have a big focus in the global south of, and, you know, for small scale fisheries. But the MSC is not an organisation just dedicated to large mm. fisheries. I think to some degree, 
an eight meter boat though isn't big by any definition is it I, I find it hard to believe that they would need all of that technological advancement to not abuse the sea because let's face it it's an eight meter boat with three people on it like what what's it possibly going to do well i guess large scale fisheries and small scale fisheries aren't mutually exclusive you can have a large fishery let's think about maybe norwegian or icelandic cod they're large fisheries they're taking lots of cod the fishery is sustainable there's a well-managed fishery you can have a small scale fishery um somewhere which is made up of hundreds of individuals of little boats who are fishing on the same target spot um stock which is actually a very vulnerable stock that's not technically sustainable but by association Celios, you think that because it's a small boat it's sustainable that's not necessarily true is it well no what i'm saying is what sort of damage could they possibly do like do you get what I mean? If they follow all the all the rules, let's say, and they do what they think's right, and they're not landing anything too big or too small, or and you know they're not they're reducing their bycatch and so on. If they're following all those rules, then they'd be classed as sustainable, wouldn't they? And also, they've got the fact that they're not going miles and miles and miles. They're literally just scraping the the Cornish coast or the Scottish coast or whatever it may be. I, I, again, I think it's a bit more complex. Then, yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I think I understand what you're, you're saying. It's very complex, and I get that. I, I respect that. But what I'm saying is, like, is there some flexibility to make it less complex for those people who do just have a very little setup? Is what I'm thinking. Well, for you know, we support small scale fisheries, and to help those fisheries access the program, we've developed a flexible suite of tools training, financial support. We also facilitate assessment of small-scale fisheries. Um, we provide guidance to help them interpret management systems and you know, take the scale and intensity of fish activities into account. You know, there are data-limited fisheries, and that's a you know key part of our standard that you know a lot of data is required to meet parts of the standard, you know. And if they don't have that, then that's difficult. But we are committed to supporting small-scale fisheries. But mm. It goes back to, like I said, they're not mutually exclusive. You could have a large scale fishery operating really well and a small scale fishery that may have issues and vice versa. It may be a small scale fishery with a few boats is operating really well. It's well managed. It's, you know, it's fishing sustainably, but you can have a large super trawler somewhere, which is moving up the oceans. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, I don't think. And that's, mm. what, that's a bit of myth busting that perhaps we need to do because people think, oh, and I'm not discrediting, you know, your 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 colleague, your you, the person you met yesterday, and saying that those fisheries aren't sustainable. But we at the MSC have a, have a definition of a sustainable fishery. Mm. I just I just wonder, especially now, post Brexit, post COVID, post everything, the UK is an island with fishermen around it on the coast. Could the MSC do something? I don't know. Like, is there something that could happen where it could help bring those into the fold? where they don't feel like they're being stuffed over or, you know, where they can't meet all those demands of a, a larger fishery. And, and yeah, that's just a thought process that I've been sort of trying to think about and pass out, really. Yeah, I'm, I mean, what can the MSC do? I mean, one thing that we did do last year, we had our first Sustainable Seafood Week. Now, you might have seen that across social media, Stelios. We had, um, it was from one week in September, we were urging consumers to, pledge to eat you know, seafood from sustainable sources for that for that week that was a pledge and beyond but prior to that we had our our what it takes campaign so that was looking at two british fisheries um cornish hake and shetland mussels and the premise of the campaign the overarching message was this is what it takes to keep fish on your plate and in your sea forever so again trying to make that connection between consumers and, and british fisheries that this is you know the food doesn't just doesn't just appear in the supermarket or on your plate you know there is hard work and a lot of effort and dedication and time that goes into these fisheries operating sustainably, going out, you know, ungodly hours. And it's a dangerous livelihood as well. That's what we've been trying to do, connecting. That's a, obviously we support small scale fisheries, but that's our sort of way of connecting consumers to, you know, the bigger picture. And that, again, we've, we spoke about this earlier, that this is where your food comes from. This is what it takes. And that's what when we is when is do. MSB Sustainable Seafood Week? I can't remember the date off my top of my head. It'll be in September again this week. Um, we'll be focusing on two other British fisheries this year um, and champion sort of their you know sustainability work that they do. And it's going to be um, Hake and... No, so Hake and Shetland Mussels were our last, year. last year. So we had All some right. beautiful 
imagery up on some billboards and uh, bus stops. Um, and it was, you know, super important to to do um, and raise awareness. Yeah, well, it'd be good to like get more sort of like obviously restaurants, fish and chip shops, and all them lot getting on involved, getting involved with that as well, wouldn't it? Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was a key focus for us last year across all of our supply chain partners. So we had fisheries involved in the campaign, fish and chip shops. So you know, those that are certified, they had digital toolkits throughout um, the week, so they could post on social media, in store assets to use. There were retailers posting on social media doing banners on websites, same with our supply chain partners. So we had a really you know, great backing from our partners and people really, you know, keen to spread the word about, you know, sustainable seafood. Yeah. Tell me about, I was just looking through our notes and been on your website. What's the Ocean Stewardship Fund? So the Ocean Stewardship Fund, again, it's one of those tongue twisters, isn't it? Um, it is a, a fund which aims to increase the number of sustainable fisheries worldwide. So, we are accelerating progress by funding innovative research and supporting fisheries at all stages on their um, path to sustainability. So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I think we, I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, around 400 fisheries certified CMSC standard. And that has grown rapidly since we were founded in 1997. And more consumers, you know, now than ever want to know where their fish has come from and are making sustainable choices and looking for the blue label. So continue to continue this trend towards more sustainable fisheries and seafood. We've committed 5% of all our royalties from MSC certified products to the Ocean Stewardship Fund. So, you know, that money provides grants available for fisheries that are on, you know, different stages on their path to sustainability. So, you know, one of the questions was in the documentary was, you know, about our funding model. Um, But that's, you know, eco-label use on pack and menu. Percentage of that goes back into, you know, making that transformative change on the oceans and supporting fisheries on their journey towards sustainability. What is there a shock from people that you have to get paid to generate funds, to generate wages, to generate schemes? There, there, there shouldn't be any shock there, surely, should there? No, I, I, we've always been entirely transparent about our funding model. You know, we are an independent non-profit organisation. We are not a commercial enterprise and we don't receive you know, income from fishery certification or chain of custody certifications. It's all done third party. We're not paid to carry out assessments. And we've personally, you know, purposefully designed the assessment process so that we do not have any say in which fisheries are certified or which businesses become certified as well. So, like I said, always been fully transparent about our funding model. There's two two parts to that. It's charitable donations from foundations and licensing into the blue MSC eco label. So, when people use the eco, when people use or businesses use the MSE eco label, they are making an impact back on you know the water. And like, you, and just going back to what you said there, Stelios, um, it's very difficult to to hear that jive. You know, the MSC is a, a corporate organisation where you know we're here to make money. Like any organisation, we need funds to survive and make that change. The same as you, as a business owner, you can't improve on your product, Stelios, if you don't. If people don't pay for them, you know, then what would you do? You'd just be stuck producing. I know you don't produce this. Like, let's just say you gave away your batter to people for free. And people said, oh, you know, it's not very good, actually. I would do this, this and this. Well, how would you do that? No, I, just to be clear, I wasn't mocking that. I actually think... No, no, no. Yeah, I actually think you've got to charge for these things. You can't. And, and free does nothing. Free does nothing. Free, you know, if... You know, if if we remove any form of profit, where would we be? I'm not being funny. Like, God knows, because there'd be no innovation. There'd be nothing. Still be yeah. roaming around on horses. And I'd give you 10 cabbages for a bit of beef. For me, I, I just I thought that was a very invalid point anyway. Well, wow, they get money. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, what else? <laughs> like, you know, it's not like it's like it's not like a Christmas party every month, is it? You're doing projects. Yeah, I mean, all the income that we get from, you know, brands, supermarkets, restaurants, fish and chip shops using the label is reinvested back into sustainable fishing initiatives, including research, management, improvement and more. That's that's just to name a, to name a few bits, you know, raising awareness so that people know what to look for and understand that right when they go into a restaurant or a fish and chip shop, they've seen that blue MSC eco label, they know what that means and they know that by purchasing that seafood, they're, they're driving change. And it's, you know, 
that's what I want to get across is that what they said, you know, wasn't new as in that that's where we make our money. We've always been completely transparent about that. For me, one thing that we've discussed about at length since we've, I've known you and I've never understood all of it fully, but this is one thing that I think I've understood right. And we just disagree on it. And that's okay. Like, you know, we're allowed to, but I truly believe that there is a serious issue. And the issue is that the majority of fish and chip shops in the UK are using probably a certified product, an MSC certified product. How do you yeah. know that? No, no, no. Because, well, they, because they are buying it through frozen at sea suppliers who are MSC um, certified and so are the vessels. So, so we know that bit. Yeah. But they can't talk about it because they haven't decided to close that, that, you know, the loop, the chain of custody. And, and for whatever reason, they just feel like, you know, that maybe they don't want to pay. Let's just let's go for the worst reason. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot left on the table there for you guys that you could actually say a lot more. You know, at the moment, for arguments, I don't know the number, but you could say we've got 100 MSC fish and chip shops in the UK. And I've just made up a number. But if you could say, oh, it's 5,000, that's surely there's somehow there's a, a way that you could bring those shops into the scheme. I don't know how you do it. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't got an answer for you here. Uh, but like, I do know that talking to like some shops, like they say, like they feel like that if the busier the busier you the busier you are the more you pay which then frustrates them because they're saying that shouldn't be the case and actually they're the ones that are in the ideal place to support it because they can actually afford it but they're saying no why should i because i don't agree with the principle that i get charged more because i'm busier so i don't I, i've not given you any answers there all i've given you is a bunch of problems and i generally like to give solutions but i do feel that you could widen your net a bit to use the pun and say, you know, because the, the fish is being used and it is MSC certified and for the most part. But you don't know that, Stelios, because that is the whole point of the chain of custody standard. Between the ocean and the water plate, fish and seafood passes through many stages and supply chains can be very complicated. The whole point of the chain of custody standard is to ensure that products from certified sustainable fisheries are traceable and separated from non-certified products. So any seafood sold with the blue MSC label needs to be traceable from ocean to plate. So for this to work, every company along the supply chain needs to be certified to the MSC chain of custody standard. And our standard ensures an unbroken chain where certified seafood is identifiable, segregated and traceable. If you don't have that chain of custody in place, you're making, an, you're making a claim and you haven't, what do you have to back up that claim? Every, you know, supply, you know, every person in supply chain, if they have chain of custody, has been audited by a third party body. So again, I'm not suggesting that we should break the chain of custody because that would be the opposite of what you're trying to do. But what I'm trying to say is how can we get more of those shops that are using a product that is currently in that chain of custody, but then it drops off at the final level? How can we complete the link? How can we get more of them on? And I know at the moment, the only answer is they need to become MSC certified because then that completes the loop. I get that. But what I'm saying is that's been a slow long hard road and it's understandable like you know it's not rome wasn't built in a day you guys have got a lot of other things going on i just wonder how we could help get more of those people over the line um, and to give you more numbers to say what a success it is that more people are in the coc um i don't know like this is something we've discussed and it's like and and it's, it's not a fault of anything other than the fact that some people maybe just don't get the message or don't like the fact that it costs more or whatever, but I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay. So we've made obviously many changes over the last year, in the last few years with our, you know, our charging structure. And you know that most organisations that sign a licence agreement and use the MSC eco label are liable to pay annual fees and depending on the eco label application royalties. But in 2017, we introduced a revised fee structure for UK food service businesses. So, fish and chip shops, restaurants, and it meant that they would still pay an annual fee to use a label, um, and that is dependent on the value of MSC seafood, fish that they purchase, um, and an additional site fee applies to businesses with more than one site. Since then, so in April 2020, we updated this, um, which takes into account feedback from UK fish and chip shops specifically and, and other restaurants, independent restaurants too, and this was specifically relating to 
the increase in price of fish and, and the fact that the M- MSC annual fee calculates, you know, is calculated upon that. So what we did was we took that feedback on board from the industry so that we could review the costs of the MSC eco label, ensure that we do have the best program available for our partners. And we feel that this structure better reflects eco label use in the industry and know that many shops have benefited from the new structure. Um, and I know that the feedback is the more you sell, the more you're penalised. But I think we aren't trying to penalise anyone. That's not that's not our intent. Our charging structure is this way because ultimately, you know, the more label, the more MSC produce you sell, the more of the label you're using, and therefore you're getting more value from using the label. And this is a, a global program now. So originally a pilot in the UK. Um, do need to find do need to find a, an approach that works for everyone. So adjusting the bands based on feedback from the industry, and we'll continue to keep um, that feedback and take it on board. Well, it's easy for me to say I don't understand your business model or your charity model. And it's easy for me to sit here and say I don't agree because I don't know what you guys know. Is it, you know? So I don't want to. I don't want listeners to think that I'm right because I'm. I might be wrong. I might be mm-hmm. wrong, and that's you know because. It's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. I, I, I think this is wider than that. It's just, I, th- I just feel like there's a lot of shops that could be included in that. Uh, you know, outlets, fish and chip shops, restaurants that are all, from from what we understand, buying an MSC product, but it drops off, it falls off, and then they can't promote it or don't promote it, and and then you don't know if they're in the in the system anymore because they fell out as well. So yeah, I don't think it's a matter of disagreement actually i think it's wider than that i think because i don't again i don't know the complications behind why mm-hmm. yeah. so I, i'm i'm sort of invalidating my point by defending your point in a strange way yeah it's a, it's a difficult one uh you know we try and be accessible to all when i welcome people's feedback on what they think the license fee should be we provide value you know there is that <laughs> You don't want them. You don't want them negotiating with you. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I, I'm. You know, we're transparent and we're welcome. We welcome no, feedback. No. We no, think no. We provide value. If we if we don't, and we can help people. You know, support them on their you know journey and their certification. Then fire things at me and and, and let us know. Yeah, that's what I like about you, Lauren. I think people can get in touch with you and and give you their feedback. And I think that's you know you do genuinely as an organisation. I, I've never known you to when I've even come up with like something that I didn't really fully understand. You've explained it to me and, or you've said, Oh, let me you know, talk to this person and then I'll get a proper answer. And then I understand it a bit more. Never once has anyone at the MSC said to me, no, we won't listen. I've not had that. So. Yeah. I think it's the same for any organization. And I'm sure you probably feel the same, regardless of how big or small the issue is, you want people to come to you and you want to be able to improve and provide a really good service and, and bring value to them. You know, they are investing in our program. And we want to provide value for them. Obviously, they are investing in, you know, increasing the number of sustainable fisheries worldwide, but they want benefit out of that too. You know, there is that brand association that they have, you know, by using the MSD label, people recognise that a bit more. But what else can we give them, you know, for all your customers as well? You know, we were talking before we started recording that, you know, one way that you package your products is using old shredding, you know, rather than buying new material, you, you shred all your bits, your, your paper at home and you use that in your packaging and card you know if someone then said to you oh i don't like that could you perhaps avoid all the waste depending on what the product was you probably listen to them and think right is there another material i can use or if someone else came to you and said hmm i don't like the way this is what do you think about this you'd be like hmm all right let me go back and let's try and figure this out together and find a solution which i could but- always i could always add no filler and then be picking up the stuff <laughs> out of the box so <laughs> You know, I know what you're saying. No, I know you've got to always think about things. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, moving on, what can you tell us about harmonisation of conditions? Right. So, I, I know. I know. Yeah. Obviously, we shared we shared the notes beforehand, so I knew this question was coming. Um, so, to start with, it's probably best that I explain what a condition is. So, I, I might have briefly mentioned this before, but for fisheries which do not meet best practice in a certain area. The fishery may need to make certain improvements during the course of its five year certificate that the fishery has. And this is called a condition. Um, harmonization is when conditions for different fisheries, typically those that are fishing on a shared stock, are aligned so that the fisheries are working to make all of the necessary improvements by the same point in time. 
So this helps in your ultimately to make sure fisheries have the same incentive for making changes. So I believe what you're probably referring to is most likely regards to tuna fisheries. Would I be correct it in is saying? Indeed. It is indeed. It is indeed. Um, so in, um, in February 2019, a group of auditors, so auditors are the independent third party bodies who go and audit fisheries and to our standard or you know businesses to the chain of custody standard. Um, so the group of auditors who are responsible for auditing MSC certified tuna fisheries submitted what is called a variation request to the MSC. That means they're asking us to do something out of the ordinary. Perhaps it's not you know, in our rule book per se. Um, and the variation request was to align conditions for tuna fisheries around harvest strategies and harvest control, route, control rules. The tuna is a highly migratory species. So many countries, fishing nations, fish on a shared stock and have a responsibility for managing those shared stocks. And this falls, this falls to regional fisheries. Management organisations, RFMOs, another acronym for you. Um, and I like to think of them as a small United Nations um, overseeing management of fisheries across oceans. So there are five RFMOs for tuna around the world, some with as many as 15 member states, and they typically manage by consensus. So now getting back to the question of these conditions, I've gone a little bit off tangent there, but a bit of you know background. Um, to ensure long-term sustainability of tuna stocks, a key part of the MSC standard are that these harvest strategies and harvest control rules, control rules, they define how catches should be reduced if a fish stock declines, which can happen for a number of reasons. It could be environmental, it could be perhaps they're just catching too much, et cetera. Um, and we, the, def the definition for harvest control rules are that they are pre-agreed, well-defined and scientifically tested and can be triggered much faster and with more reliable effects than perhaps asking the management authority to consider each situation independently or, you know, especially when consensus is required. Um, and these are considered best practice by the MSC standard. And as a result, most MSC certified tuna fisheries have conditions to adopt these harvest control rules. And that's in order to make sure that all countries and fishing nations with MSC certified fisheries have the same incentives. So the auditors have asked MSC to align the date by which these fisheries need to have harvest control rules adopted by the RFMO and the MSC agreed, they accepted that variation request, which is what I mentioned earlier. So we accepted that very variation request, which set the original deadline for adopting harvest control rules as 2021 for tuna fisheries in the Western and Central Pacific. That is the date that the RFMO for that region has said they were working towards. Since then, a number of changes have happened. The RFMO for the Western and Central Pacific revised their own timeline to, to when they think they will be able to adopt harvest control rules. So that's 2022. That's what they've changed it to. Um, and MSC have also responded to the COVID pandemic by issuing a derogation, the first six month one and then one year on. And this derogation made allowance for certain conditions, specifically those that were dealing with management issues. Um, we, you know, as an organisation recognised that there were lots of challenges in the past year. And, you know, these challenges were particularly difficult to face um, or to, particularly difficult to address when you couldn't perhaps hold face-to-face -face meetings because of the pandemic. You know, we've spent the last year on Zoom, really, haven't we? You know, talking and having meetings. And as a result, the timeline for when these conditions around harvest strategies and harvest control rules, the tuna fisheries in the Western and Central Pacific was extended to June 2023. Now, keep in mind that these RFMOs typically hold one major annual meeting where they discuss management measures um, for the RFMO in the Western and Central Pacific, this is in December. So this means that for tuna fisheries in the Western and Central Pacific, the December 2021 and December 2022 RFMO meetings are very critical if they want to meet that condition. That's probably a very long-winded answer. I've realised I've been on for a, minute, a few minutes there, but it's a very interesting, um, very interesting question. Um, like I said, tuna is very complex it's a very, also very exciting, very cool fish and mm. um, lots of challenges with tuna sourcing. And hopefully this will address, you know, perhaps things that need to be implemented. Let's end with some good news. You've got to go soon because you're a busy girl. Um, <laughs> so give us a market report. What's going on out there? So our market report, we released this December. So this is a, a UK team initiative. So I worked on this and, this was our first sort of market report, which was showcasing the leadership of the UK and Irish markets in sustainable seafood. And 
And what it does, it's available on our website if you want to read it. Um, it highlights the, the growing number of certified products and menu offerings available to consumers um, and also, you know, highlights the emerging sectors as well. So, you know, you've got your typical sectors that we work with, but, you know, pet food is a growing market. There's lots more sustainable pet food. People, you know, pet food, pet, pet owners want um, food that's good for their pets, that's good for the ocean too. It sounds a bit nuts, but, you know, are you saying that because you saw me laughing? Pardon? <laughs> you said it sounds nuts because you saw me laughing. Yeah, I saw you. Um, I saw the the question marks gloss over your face. I um, guess. I guess. In one sense, though, there would be more uh, pet food that's certified if there's more human food that's being certified because there'd be more waste. Does that make sense? Because pet food is usually byproduct of human food, isn't it? Not necessarily. How is it not? No, not always. Oh, I always thought it was. Oh, no. No, animal food I mean, is problem. I always thought it I was. I think <laughs> <laughs> this is quite interesting. I think baby food as well, um, supplements too. I think, you know, ultimately growing consumer awareness of the pressures overfishing puts on fish populations and our oceans had le has led to an increase in demand for certified products. Wow. Um, you know, we do a, I think, you know, so that's, we do a, a sort of consumer insight study every two years. So we've done it three years, three times now. It's a biannual study. So 2016, 2018, 2020. And um, it's conducted by an independent organization called GlobeScan. Um, and our, that study found that 72% of UK consumers recognize the importance of only consuming fish and seafood that comes from sustainable sources and 83% are willing to take action to protect fish and seafood in the future. So it's, you know, we've seen a massive demand for sustainable seafood and businesses really making that commitment to sourcing from fisheries that are well managed. And hopefully that that trend will continue. Um, there's lots to be done. I think we can all agree across multiple issues, but that's probably a positive note. I recommend if anyone wants to read it, it's on our website and, you know, quite interesting. You can see the growth over time. The new emerging markets, the, the traditional ones we work with, fish and chips, um, like you know, different categories, frozen, fresh, canned, yeah. for example. As well, so one last question, and you can finish the, the sentence for me. Is okay, there such a thing as sustainable seafood? Is there such thing as sustainable Sea. seafood? Yes, there is. Like I said earlier, the amazing thing about our oceans is that. If we do manage fish stocks sustainably, they can recover and thrive. So sustainable fishing means that we leave enough fish in the ocean so that fish populations remain productive and healthy. And if you have, you know, sustainable fisheries, then you can have sustainable seafood as well. You know, we want the world's oceans teeming with life and we want to safeguard stocks for future generations. And we can't do that without, you know, sustainable fisheries and people working hard. And ultimately, that's what it all boils down to is, people working together with, you know, one shared mission, really. Fantastic. Well, Lauren, thank you for your time today. And, you know, I don't, I don't make light of the situation. You, 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 there is a lot going on and you guys are really trying to push forward with it. And it's no yeah. Problem. I think the last few weeks have been quite difficult. Oh, am I allowed, genuinely... am I allowed to say, like, I can't believe like you guys got death threats and everything. We never even touched on that. That's like, seriously, no one deserves that guy. He's like, Mm, I know. I, I mean, on a professional level, we completely understand the issues. And, you know, as I said before, we don't disregard the, you know, what the film highlighted and, and the atrocities that we see in you know, fishing and, and, and in, in the oceans. But as an organisation and personally, uh, you know, as an individual and our team, we're working really hard, you know, on a day to day basis. And, and we're genuinely passionate. So, so to see the negativity across social media and to receive things, you know, directly to us. It's, it's very difficult. Um, and I know many people don't agree with us or believe in our, you know, in our vision and mission, but we want to start this as sort of, you know, at a conversation. We want to have a conversation with people when starting from a place of education. I mean, but despite that and despite the negativity, um, you know, our commercial team and our UK team and our counterpart counterparts around the world, we've been in touch with many of our supply chain partners, retail, food service, fish and chip shops, and the response has been, you know, overwhelmingly supportive, really, which is, you know, we're super pleased about, you know, I was on the phone to 
Pete Fraser not long before this podcast. I know he won't mind me saying this, but he's promised to fly the MSC flag, you know, even higher than before. And many have reaffirmed their commitment to the programme and recognise that it does have a, a transformational role to play that can give a real and lasting change to the way our oceans are fished by rewarding best practice. I guess it's worth saying, if anybody's listening to this and they disagree or agree or have a feedback or whatever it is, and they don't get in touch, then they can't really complain about it because they didn't get in touch. So, you know, and you said to me, you really wanted to encourage the fact that they should get in touch and, you know. Yeah, I mean, we've had some, I gave a few examples of um, feedback that we've had. We've, we've since had feedback, you know, about some of our, our newsletters that we send out and ways we can change them and make them more engaging. Super, because there are so many things we can add to them and make them more exciting. If, if people are reading them, then brilliant. Let's let's try and make them more exciting, and and that's what you want to read as well. So, yeah, like I said, come to us and and let's chat and let's see what we can do. Fantastic, Lauren. On that note, thank you for your time. Thanks, Elias, and hopefully I can come back again on in a few years. If it's still going. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it'll be up to. I don't think it'd be up to me. I think it's whether you want to. You know? Sure. You can hold me. Yeah, let's book a date in for two years' time. Let's see where we are. Yeah, let's do that. All right, mate. Thanks, Elias. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sarah's Podcast. This was brought to you by Sarah's Pure Food Innovation and your host, the founder and managing director, Stelios. This episode wouldn't have been possible without our episode supporters, Amity Fish Company. Scampi is often overlooked. Why not wow and delight your guests today by ordering from Amity Fish Company? Jimmy's hands-on approach ensures nothing slips under the net. Amity's dedicated team are focused on the values of quality, sustainability, traceability and provenance, ensuring only the best Scottish catch will reach your home or business. Support us by supporting our sponsors. And whilst you're in the supporting mood, why not leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts? It helps others find us.